So we're going to try out my new nifty mouse. We're going to talk about special cellular transport. And this is where we look at the mosaic part of the fluid mosaic model. So remind me, fluid mosaic, that's a two word. What are the two things that pretty much make up all your cell membranes? What's the fluid part? Uh, no, no, just talking about the membrane. Remember, fluid mosaic is just the membrane. The cytoplasm is a fluid, the solution it's in is a fluid, and on top of that, the membrane itself is actually a fluid. Remember, your cell membrane is literally water with a ring of oil with more water on the inside. What, what? Phospho. Yeah, it's a phospho of it. So the fluid part, that's because of the phospho of it. That's what gives the cell membrane its fluidity. Right? That's the reason why those little uncharged molecules can just slip right in. It's a fluid. They can't stop it. We're going to look at all the things that can't get in that way today. They're using the mosaic. They're using, what are those, what's stuck all in that phospholipid by there? Protein. Yeah, proteins, because it's covered in ribosomes. <coughs> Vesicles are involved, and that's how it gets sent to the cell membrane. And then they're literally just shoved right in the cell membrane and stuck there. And the cell uses those proteins, that's the mosaic in the fluid mosaic model, to do all these special kind of transports. So let's talk about how cells can get large molecules in. Right? We know that they can't go in on their own. But a lot of times your cells need to have large molecules like, I don't know, sugar. That's what your mitochondria uses to make ATP. If no sugar gets into the cell, mitochondria is not making any ATP. And guess what? You die. Among other large things that need to go in. So this one we already know about the whole free diffusion, the little molecules going in. But large molecules can also go in with the help of a carrier protein. So carrier proteins, those are proteins that just allow large molecules to go through. Like, look at this. Look at that molecule. It's bigger than the phospholipids. So you need a big old protein channel just for it to go right through. Now that is actually called facilitated diffusion. Anybody want to guess why? What's the protein doing? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's facilitating diffusion. Facilitating is a word that means like helping, assisting, making happen. Sometimes I will go to meetings and those meetings will be facilitated. So tell me, which way are these molecules going to go then? If it's facilitated diffusion, it's just diffusion with the help of the carrier protein. So which way are the molecules going to go? You don't need the C word. High to low concentration. Yeah, concentration. They're going to go from high to low concentration. It still has to follow the concentration gradient. And it still goes from high concentration to low concentration from area where the molecules are all bunched up to the area where they're not bunched up. And since it's diffusion, do you think it's going to take any energy? No, which would make it what kind of path, what kind of transport? Passive or active? Yeah, passive transport. So it's just diffusion. It's just diffusion that needs a little help. Here's some examples. Water. When it's not really doing osmosis because water has to go through those aquaporins. That's a good example. That's one of the reasons why it takes longer than diffusion. So diffusion would be option A. Osmosis is the backup plan. Doesn't take any energy. Just has to go through that aquaporin. Uh, glucose in and out of the cell, that's an important thing that needs to be in the cell. Uh, your stomach does it. You have these other things called ion-gated channels. If I'm going to drive into a gated community, what do I have to go through? Security. The, the gate, right? Oh, yeah. like, like my car could fit, but there's a stubborn gate that's shut in the way. Works the same way. You have an ion that actually hook up to the carrier protein, it's called a gate, an ion ligand gate, and then it'll actually change the shape of it and open up to allow whatever's supposed to go through to go through. Sometimes those also take ATP. Neurotransmitters are another one. They're usually too big to just go right through the cell membrane, so they use facilitated diffusion. They use what kind of protein was it again? Yeah, a carrier protein, good to get through. Hormone intake is a fun one, only for some of them, not for all of them. Now, Dylan, ask that question <laughs> ask again. Um, does, it ever, does the area of concentration ever go to low to high? Right. That would be weird. That would be like a long way, wouldn't it? Yeah. Nice. That can happen. Sometimes it'll move, it's called moving against the gradient or moving up the gradient. Think of it the same way as like a car getting pushed up a hill. If I have a car 
and I'm at a hill. Where is the car? Here's the car. Uh, that's pretty big car. And where's it gonna go? On its own. Let's say the parking brake's not set. Where's it gonna go? Yeah. Yeah, so it's gonna naturally go to. Do I have to apply any energy to the car for it to happen? No. In fact, it'd be kind of hard to stop. So it gets all the way down here. Now, what if I wanted to push the car up the hill? Yeah, it's going to take some energy because it's going against the direction that it naturally wants to go. It's the same thing with concentration gradient. Those molecules want to go from the high concentration to the low concentration. To go against it is going to take some energy. And it's going to require not just a passive carrier protein. It needs a transport protein. We've got to transport that stuff. Here's a picture. And so you can imagine that if you had some high concentration over here and we had a low concentration over here, but whatever this green stuff is needs to not be in the cell, so it's just raw and shooting it out. It's going to take ATP because we're moving it the way it doesn't want to go. And so if the other way that doesn't take any energy is called passive transport, what's this one going to be called? Yeah, active transport. And because it's using ATP, we call it active transport. It requires energy, so it's active transport. Here's a couple examples. Ion pumps. And like it sounds in the name, they're actually pumping the ions against their gradient. These are going to be huge in our next unit on cellular metabolism. There's going to be ion pumps like the day is long to help us generate ATP. So it actually takes a lot of energy to make the energy, and we'll see how that could possibly work. It also happens a lot in muscle contraction. Sodium and <coughs> potassium are the two main ions involved in making your muscles work, which is one of the reasons why you can cramp up really badly if you're at low in potassium, or if you have too much sodium, it can make it really hard for you to move on top of, you know, pulling water out of your cells and dehydrating you and giving you heart attacks, which is bad. Uh, yeah. Another one, the, the chloride channel, preventing kidney stones, has a lot of active transport going on. Your kidney is a super active organ. Its job is literally to make sure that your cells are always in an isotonic solution. If you're drinking your sugar-coated, sugary energy drinks with all the caffeine, or even pop, even juice, that's a hypertonic solution. What's it going to do to the water with your cells? What's it going to do, Chance? It's going to pull the water out. Which means you're making your kidneys work harder. You're making your kidneys work harder because what they're doing is pulling water out of your waist and putting it back into your blood. Anybody know what waste the kidney makes? Urine. Yeah, it makes urine. And it's kind of gross, but how do you know if you're drinking enough water? What's like the what's the saying? You can tell. Um, you should be like. Yeah, right. The, you know, when you have clear urine, that means there's a lot of water in it. It means your kidney doesn't have to constantly be pulling and reabsorbing water out of the urine to send back into your blood. The darker your urine is, the more water your kidneys have to pull out, which means the harder your kidney's working, which can lead to not fun things like kidney stones. Moral of the story, drink more water. I'm not saying you shouldn't drink the nasty, dirty energy drinks, which, by the way, you shouldn't because they're terrible for you. But if I you do drink those things, farmer, Grant Reams, a poor bunch, you need to make sure you drink a lot of water to go with it. And Greg Wyatt. I'm going to have to shut you up. Thing. Have a nice day. Oh, that was pretty quick. All right. Now, what if we wanted to move like tons of things or just like a really big thing? Like how do your white blood cells eat a whole bacteria? I mean, that's way bigger than a transport protein. gather around it. It's actually even cooler than that. Anytime that we have a lot of things we want to move all together, or one really like freaking huge thing to move, we actually use a ton of ATP and completely change the cell membrane. Vesicles are involved. Here's your picture. It's called endocytosis or exocytosis. Exocytosis is going to move things where? What's exo? Yeah, outer. Outer cyto is cell, outer cell. Osis is actually a word that means action. So literally this word means outside cell action. Endocytosis is inner cell action. They pretty much are exactly the same thing, just in reverse. 
Here we have a vesicle full of some stuff that the cell wants to get rid of with exocytosis. The vesicle literally hooks up to the cell membrane here and just whoop, and folds in and shoves the stuff out of the cell. Obviously it would be if it has something that it wants to get in, the cell goes up to it, starts wrapping the cell membrane around it, and pulling it down in, and then the vesicle here just pops right off and moves through the cytoplasm, moves along the cytoskeleton. Really good example here, neurotransmitters, hormones, right? The hormone is a targeted signal for a large portion of your body. A lot of them are made right in your pancreas. Your pancreas has to dump tons of that into your blood so that, that way it can control your head and your heart and your everything else. That way, you know, when you're focusing on your hormonal teenage things, your heart has to be beating really fast too. You love exocytosis that way. Another big one, the macrophages, your white blood cells. I mean, they're engulfing an entire bacteria. You just gobble it up. Endocytosis. So the question is, how come the vesicles are able to do that? Why can they interact with the cell membrane this way? It's the best part. That question is your homework. Let me know tomorrow when you come to class.